Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we welcome Dr. Ian Evans, architectural historian, author, and conservationist. Dr. Evans' 2010 thesis, Touching Magic, was the first ever academic examination of the historic use of witches' marks, bottles, and other apotropaic magic in Australia. Dr. Evans, thank you for your time. A pleasure. A great pleasure. So, uh, Ian, we've been emailing backwards and forwards because you've been doing some research that is near and dear to my Australian heart. And I guess my first question is, uh, have old houses and, and old architecture uh, always been an interest of yours? Uh, going a long way back, yes, yes, indeed. Um, not quite sure where it came from. It might have been the old house I lived in in parks in the central west of New South Wales. Um, I went back there many years ago um, after I'd written a few books about uh, old houses and discovered to my considerable surprise that this old house was filled with rim locks and decorative plaster and nice joinery and so on and so forth, and all the things I'd been writing about. <laughs> so I think what I was doing in uh, writing those early books about Australian houses is to, uh, was trying to uh, repair my dysfunctional family of origin. I see. So this is a childhood home that has all those kind of pieces and and um, yes. and components. Fascinating. My mother was a, a teacher in parks. There you go. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, we in, probably passed in the street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> depending, depending on when she was there. True. Also, I left in I think uh, 1959. No, no, you missed by about a decade. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a it's okay. a cool town though. It's an interesting place. It could have been so much nicer if the council had left the wonderful cast iron verandas on the old pubs. But at one stage in the 1950s, there was this uh, rage about taking these things down because the posts on which they depended uh, tended to come into contact with cars parking in the street in front. Instead of extending the, the um, footpath just a little bit, they took down the entire verandas and ruined the character of the town. This is a, I want to say singularly Australian mania, but the, the Kiwis have it too. And it's something about the mid-20th century, and it drives me crazy. So um, yeah. when, when we yeah. moved back, we just did eight years in London, and when we moved back uh, middle of last year, uh, I was sort of looking for different places in the greater Sydney area uh, to live in. And I found out... Yeah that Parramatta has more heritage buildings than the rocks. I said, I, I haven't been to yeah. Parramatta in 20 years. I'll go and have a look. And it's, it's a dumpster fire. It's a mess of mid-20th yeah. century car parks. And you think this could... What, what, was, what were you smoking in the mid-20th century to, to kind of That's ruin this? Right. Yes, yes, I know. A uh, great loss. A great loss. So is that... I mean, I guess it was the heritage thing. Did you know you were going to kind of... Uh, was heritage and history a thing for you growing up? Uh, well, I did some research uh, in, when I lived in parks, uh, you know, as a, as a lad. Um, uh, I would have been about 16 or 17, but I was interested in the history of the town, so I did a little research then. So it, it does go back a very long way. Who knows how these things start? And what about the, uh, and what about the folk magic component of it? Were you, uh, were you a sort of... Fantasy fiction and science fiction reader? Was that always something in the back of your head? No, 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 it wasn't. It was far from my thoughts. Um, you know, I wrote a series of entirely straightforward and functional books about, uh, you know, the history and conservation of old Australian houses, never for a moment thinking that there was a great big secret hiding away in all of these houses. And, uh, you know, uh, eventually I would uh, come to discover it. And how, how, I mean, what was the genesis of that? When did you, when did it occur to you, uh, oh, wait a minute, there's something we've all missed yes, here? Yes, well, I can pinpoint it exactly. It occurred over lunch with some colleagues, one from English Heritage, one an independent researcher, 
and we were having lunch in Savile Row in London in, I think, well, a date in 2002. I could find a date, but anyway. And Savile Row was chosen because this cafe in Savile Row was close to where this chap in English Heritage worked. And before going to England, I had been aware of the practice of concealing shoes and other artefacts in old houses and other buildings there. And during the course of lunch, somehow or other, this subject came up and I said, oh, I presume it faded out after the end of the witchcraft scare in, you know, maybe the 17th century. And uh, well, they said, no, 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 no. It kept right on going, right through the 18th and 19th centuries. And there was my eureka moment, because I realised if this was happening in England in the 19th century, there was a damn good chance that it was happening in Australia too. And so when I came home, I put a notice on the email mailing list of uh, heritage advisors in New South Wales and Victoria. And within 24 hours, I started getting reports of strange things being found in uh, houses and other buildings throughout uh, these two states. And then I was off and away on the hunt, <laughs> which uh, culminated about 10 years later with my PhD. And uh, roughly, how many how many objects have you got? On the, uh, you know, on the the Australian list now of um, probable folk magic concealments. Uh, well, I think they're pretty well certain. Um, I haven't kept score because um, after I finished the thesis, which had about a hundred different um, concealment uh, caches locations, um, I thought, right, well, you know, I've made my point. These things are here, there, and everywhere, and there's no longer any question about their, uh, you know, reality. Uh, there they are, and people can take it from there. But towards the end of the thesis, I, I, I came across these marks on buildings, and I, it eventually occurred to me that I ought to keep looking and see what else I could find out. And I came to the conclusion that the Concealed objects were the tip of an iceberg of belief in magic and practice of magic in Australia in the 19th century. And so it's gone on. And it's, um, we don't know, I mean, you mentioned this in the thesis, we don't know how far back because Australia doesn't have uh, too many 18th century buildings left. Uh, so it, we it, we kind of have the objects, the concealed objects showing up around the 1820s, but given that the practice predates that in the mother country, it's reasonable to well, assume that... Well, you have, you have the exact same problem in England because they don't have their houses going back far enough to trace this uh, practice to its origins. The earliest they've found concealed shoes is, I think, uh, the 13th century. Um, in Winchester Cathedral. And there's not much surviving and standing from before that date, unless you uh, consider the occasional castle ruin uh, and a bit of Roman wall here and there. Uh, there's nowhere to look. So, you know, the mystery continues. But, but there are clues, and... Um, the clues have been found in ritual pits dug by Romans in, in the Scottish border areas. And in these pits, they tossed a mixture of rubbish and ritual objects. And the ritual objects included all sorts of things, including perfectly good stone querns, which were used for grinding grain, and quite a variety of shoes, which are in, uh, in the... the uh, Scottish National Museum in, I think, uh, Edinburgh. Yes, Edinburgh. And I've illustrated some of these finds in, in my thesis so people can look them up and see. But it's pretty clear the Romans had a thing about shoes. And I have a theory. You know, I, I kept wondering, you know, we have these... Uh, these shoes, which were concealed in Australia in various locations by people from many different places in England. And I kept thinking, how could they have, how could this have spread? 
so thoroughly throughout England at a time when people hardly bothered going to the next village. There just wasn't the level of communication throughout the country. And my theory is that it came into to England with the Roman legions and was spread by the legions as they went throughout England. So that's how old I believe this practice to be. And, uh, I mean, that kind of tantalisingly pushes on the door behind the legions uh, as to where the the practice showed up within Roman culture because obviously you have (laughs) similar things going back to archaic Greece and, and presumably even earlier. Correct, correct, yes. Lost in the mists of time, perfectly good phrase to apply to this uh, particular practice. But I think it's fascinating that um, we're seeing here in Australia something that the Romans probably took to Britain. And some of the later objects uh, that uh, are in your thesis are from the 1930s, so within living memory kind of stuff. Yes, correct. You know, I did a lot of radio interviews and I kept waiting for the old tradesmen to ring up and say, we we concealed these things. We did it. But nobody ever did. I think I just missed that generation of uh, building tradesmen who may have been involved in this. I, um, I was trying to find it in preparation for our talk, but uh, last year or the year before, uh, you might even know it, that there was an article that came out, I think it was in Cornwall, of one of these sort of folk magic votive pits by the looks of it still being used in the early 70s. So uh, in, in, in that case, you can essentially still call it like a, a living, continuous tradition in some places. Yes, I don't think it. I don't think it uh, lived on in in Australia for much after about the the nineteen thirties. Although with an occasional perhaps uh, outburst in the forties, uh, but I have no evidence of uh, anything significantly later than that. And why do you suppose that is? I mean, let's let's answer that question two ways. Uh, firstly, what did why did people conceal objects? Like, what did they think it would do? And uh, why did it stop? Okay. Well, I think what was going on was that they they had no idea of the way the universe worked. And their belief was that there was an underworld swirling around and intersecting with our world of reality. And in this underworld, there were evil spiritual beings that uh, were malicious had malicious feelings towards humans, so they sought to do harm. And the idea of the concealments, I believe, is was to decoy these evil spiritual beings away from the people in a house and into a void from which they could not escape. And so concealments were planted under floors, in chimneys, um, in cavities, wherever they could find them in the building. And I think many of these were planted by building tradesmen. Uh, Others were planted by homeowners, occupants of houses. And they also kept adding to the the caches where these were accessible, perhaps in the the roof cavity, uh, over a period of time, because I think they feared that the, the magic would wear off that these that the magic needed to be topped up and reinforced from time to time with fresh shoes. Now, sorry, what was your next question? The next Gordon? question was why. So that you expect that died off around the thirties in Australia because by then you have people going to government schools and 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 getting a uh, exactly yeah exactly. I think it was um, education. Uh, better understanding of the reality of the world. Um, and, you know, people just uh, got over it, if you like, uh, by means of, uh, you know, their intelligence and their understanding of uh, the way the world worked, which uh, gradually increased during the century. I um, I find it really compelling. I know we, when we were emailing backwards and forwards, uh, I mentioned Jim Baker's book, The Cunning Man's Handbook. And in there, there are these um, charms to not necessarily get rid of the devil, but uh, keep him away because you can't banish the devil. It's a thing God created. But you can send him to go and count 
every grain of sand on the beach or every leaf in the woods. And it's a way okay. of um, tricking or, or slowing up the devil if it's coming after you. And I, I find that kind of, I find that very lyrical. And I think that there's a similar mentality with the shoe or the, or the witch's bottle where, uh, uh, where it gets, yeah. where it gets trapped, where you're outsmarting this force. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's very lyrical, I think. I, I don't think they had a high regard for the intellectual cap- capabilities of these spirits. Exactly. That's the, bit, <laughs> the devil is basically the first created thing on earth, and he's, he's going to be tricked by sand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not too smart, the devil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's, um, I mean, we've mentioned shoes. Uh, what other kind of objects would, uh, particularly in Australia, oh, no, two questions. Um, what what's like a list of classical concealed objects that are used for the sort of apotropaic magic, and does the kind of Australian lift list differ in any noticeable way from like the mother country? Um, in Australia, we tend to have shoes, and they're single shoes, which is an intriguing little mystery in itself, because there was an ancient practice uh, whereby when you created a contract for the sale of land or property or whatever Uh, you know you had this document and you tore it in half and each and you exchanged the halves and each person therefore had an interest in this property now why do we see single shoes (laughs) was there a contract and who was the other party to the contract i can't answer that question okay so shoes Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> uh, the other interesting thing about the shoes is that the great majority, at least half of them, were the shoes of children and young people. And is that uh, Australia-specific, was... or is that the same, same no, place in England? No, it's not. Yeah. No, it's the same in England. And what I think was going on was that they were using the power of the good and the innocent to defeat evil. And I find that fascinating. Now, the other things that are found are garments, um, uh, domestic uh, utensils, and um, you know bits and pieces, bits and pieces. Um, and it's interesting. I think uh, we have two convict shirts. Well, two and a bit convict shirts. Uh, one and a bit were found in Hyde Park Barracks in Sydney. And the other shirt was found in the convict uh, overseer's uh, cottage at uh, Granton in Tasmania, overlooking a uh, major bridge works crossing the uh, the Derwent River there. And were it not for this r- amazing ritual, we would have, have no convict shirts in our museums. Not a one. But thankfully, because of this ritual, we have two. And were they found over the course of your research, or were they found earlier and then as a result of kind of realising, oh, hang on, concealment to this folk magic practice, that's probably why we got them? Yes, that that, that, uh, was, um, you know, looking back on on discoveries that had been made some time previously. Uh, The Hyde Park Barracks shirt, they kind of lost the record of exactly where it was, but it it is thought to have been secreted in a staircase, which is a logical reason, logical place to put put a uh, a ritual object because uh, nasty things might use stairs as well as people. And uh, the other shirt at Granton was um, built into a wall of the cottage. Do we get uh, some of the sort of more exciting ones like witches' bottles and, you know, um, preserved hearts on, on in Australia? I, I yearn for a witch's bottle, Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have a slim chance of there being a witch bottle out there somewhere. Uh, because it was uh, Australia was within the period of time in which witch bottles were still being made. Uh, in England, although probably not as many. And, um, you know, I yearn for the day when someone gets in touch and says, I found this strange bottle. And um, 
if anybody is listening who finds one, please don't open it. We yeah. need to get the content <laughs> analysed before you yeah. open it. Because these things can be very intriguing. You know, they sort of rattle and slosh. Well, I don't know if they'd slosh after 200 years, but they certainly do rattle because there are some wonderful things inside them. There, are, there were originally um, things like hearts cut from felt and pierced by bent nails to send the magic back against the witch. And then there might be a hank of hair, there might be, and there certainly would have been urine, because it was intended to afflict the witch in her, his or her bladder and cause excruciating pain, and thus you would be able to identify the witch in your village by the fact that he or she became very ill after you planted a witch bottle. So if, uh, if, if we don't have witch bottles, what was, if you can say this, what was your like, personal favourite uh, concealed object you found over the course of the research? <laughs> well, there have been some wonderful shoes and... Um, Probably my personal favourite find is not a particular shoe or object, but the 39 shoes found in one house in Tasmania. And that was at Woodbury, just north of Oaklands in the Midlands of Tasmania. Uh, 39 shoes, a couple of parasols, two hats, um, documents. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> well, they must have had a fairly serious ghost problem. That seems like overkill. Uh, well, there was there there were uh, some deaths in the family, and quite often uh, concealments appear to be linked to deaths in the family. And you can imagine that in the nineteenth century, there were quite often deaths in the family. I mean, you've only got to walk through a nineteenth century graveyard, and you'll see the the graves of little children who died very early on, or young women who died in childbirth. And I think people lived with the fear of death as a, as a daily event. You know, you, you, would, um, you would, as a parent, have perhaps eight, nine, ten, or twelve children, and you would know there was a very good chance that not all of your lovely children were going to make it to adulthood. So, yeah. you know. uh, I live in Windsor, and we have some of the... Um, we've got graveyards coming back to... Yes, uh, I think the earliest grave is about 1798, and it is the most amazing experience walking through and and uh, yeah. and, and painting a picture of it. Because I, I, what I guess people listening may not realise, if you're from Lancashire and you come to Australia in 1830, uh, this is a horrifying place. It's too hot. Everything can kill you. Um, the natives yeah. are terrifying. I mean, if you had in the back of your head any kind of, you may have actually lapsed <laughs> in your folk magic back in in Lancashire, but you get here, and I was uh, yeah. the sound of the sound of possums mating at night sounds like a demon. You know, it's 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 a crazy I know, place. I know, and and you can imagine uh, the convicts uh, arriving by ship in Sydney Harbour in the, about 1815 or 1820. And they marched up Macquarie Street and accommodated in Hyde Park barracks and the doors slammed shut at night and down in the forest in Woolloomooloo they would hear uh, dingoes and bizarre bird calls and screeches of possums and bats and heaven only knows what else. And it would have been terrifying and they would have seen the sun, uh, you know, the, the very skies were alien to them. And so it would have been a very disorientating experience. And I think to believe that these people left their cultural baggage on the wharf in London as they stepped aboard ship is just ridiculous. You know, they brought it all with them and they used it out here to protect themselves and their families. And also just to uh, remember it, I, um, the, I don't know if you watched it a few years ago, the um, ABC uh, sort of miniseries based on Kate Grenville's book, The Secret River. And uh, one of the characters in that keeps teaching her children songs like Oranges and Lemons. And it's, it's, it's actually done yeah. quite well in the, uh, in the miniseries because it's contrasted with 
the uh, the sort of music of the the tribes that she can hear outside her hut, and there's this almost um, cultural war yeah, going yeah. on of, of trying to like evoke London uh, on the banks of the Hawkesbury River. And I, I think yeah. I think people would have yeah. really doubled down on their folk magic when they got here. I do too. I do too. I think uh, it was a very scary experience coming to Australia. And then after that, I mean, I have uh, the the last, well, one of the um, questions towards the end, but we might as well do it now. Um, yep. Australia's Australia was Tasmania. So uh, that was the place you got to, <laughs> if you were too bad for Australia, you ended up there. And that uh, that must have been the most yeah. astounding thing. I'm not surprised that the kind of biggest concealment hall uh, is, is in Tasmania. Well, that is one reason why we're... Uh... Well, I've launched the Tasmanian Magic Project. Um, um, you know, I want to do a field survey, and uh, we're setting out to do a trial survey next month uh, in the Midlands, southern Mid- Midlands. And we will approach the owners of uh, old houses in that uh, area and uh, hopefully be allowed uh, access to look through their barns and stables and so on and so forth, the outbuildings. And see if we can find any of these evil averting marks, which I suspect would have been used to protect uh, the householders and uh, their property, their horses, their cattle, their sheep, their whatever, from um, absconding convicts, um, bush rangers, and uh, hostile Aborigines. And you know, I can entirely understand and sympathise with the. Uh, with the Aborigines who had unfettered access to these hunting grounds for oh, 30,000 years at least, and suddenly these people were coming in and putting up fences and had uh, stockmen and uh, shepherds patrolling, and, uh, you know, suddenly their kangaroos were being shot, and, you know, it was just a horrible experience and a horrible time. Yeah, that's where we were the worst um, by some margin, is in Tasmania. Uh, the 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 colonist experience must have been terrifying as well because uh, uh, I forget the name of the guy when they were rounding up uh, the Australian or the Tasmanian Aborigines to put them on. Um, I forget which island it was, and they essentially yes. paid people to kind of systematically go down through the country from to the, the state from top to bottom the whole island well they, they, they had a, a, a line of soldiers and settlers and they walked all the way through the, the island and they found about three aborigines yeah so these guys this is what i mean like you, you would be putting up the witches marks and and so on in the barn yeah. because uh, the, the natives yeah. vanish actually vanish <laughs> that's right that's right that's right and uh uh, you know, you can imagine the, the fear of uh, a settler. He's in his house at night. Uh, there are probably two muskets in the house and a couple of uh, convict maids. And uh, there are 30,000 Aborigines with burning brands outside the house. It would be a bit scary. And so the Tasmania Project, is that because there is it's sort of relatively... Uh, unexplored from this kind of archaeological perspective, or is it because there are many more kind of, I guess, per capita-wise heritage buildings left uh, in regional Tasmania? Well, both of those reasons. Um, um, I'm, I'm using Tasmania as an exemplar for the whole of Australia because I think what is true in Tasmania, what I find in Tasmania will hold true for the rest of Australia. But I can't possibly <laughs> explore the whole of Australia looking for magic marks. But Tasmania is a different story. Um, it's got about 40% of the surviving heritage buildings in, in the country. And many of these are still in the hands of the original families. I heard the other day of one property settled uh, not too far from Hobart in 1808. And it is now in the hands of the seventh generation of that family. And the tendency is, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, <clears throat> the tendency is that uh, these places are often kept substantially intact. They're not fiddled around with. Whereas if you get a lot of people, you know, turning houses over and different people coming in and they change things, 
But Tasmania has a lot of intact buildings. And uh, there's also the very significant reason is it, it's, it's small and it's easy to get around. You know, you don't have mountains to cross. Um, and, I can, I, you know, if we're based somewhere in the Midlands of Tasmania, at, say, Woodbury, uh, near Oatlands, um, you know, you can pretty much be anywhere in Tasmania within an hour, certainly within the Midlands, where uh, the majority of these properties that I want to see are located. So it's the best place to start. And it brings up a question. What, are there any differences... Uh, between sort of town and country in terms of, in Australia in particular, in terms of who used concealed objects more or, I mean, can we can we infer something along those lines? Um, it's a bit hard to do that. I do think that um, many concealments were the work of uh, building trades. I believe that um, uh, this was a secret and ancient ritual of the building trade. But I also think that it escaped and crossed over into the general public. Uh, another very quite remarkable feature of it, and there are a number of remarkable features and untold stories, is that this was a practice that was never recorded in any contemporary document. You will not find a word about it anywhere in Australia, in England, or North America uh, that was written at the time it was being done and describing it, and they do not exist. But this was a secret that everyone knew. <laughs> they didn't write it down. They just didn't never write it down. Does that, um, I guess that kind of supports the, uh, you know, the thesis that, it does. As it was something passed through the building trade because I'm just surprised that it escaped the um, 19th century urban folklorists wandering out into the English countryside, looking for the no like, imagining they these didn't find little it. survival. Isn't that they odd? They didn't though? find it know, because they found everything else. I know that it wasn't is there. odd. Yeah. I, know, I know it is. I know it is odd. And the folklore society sent, uh, you know, teams of volunteers out into the back blocks of England. And they were looking for things. They were looking for uh, surviving but endangered species of folklore, and they never found this. Yeah, that is odd, isn't it? Um, it so is. what do you think then happened? Do you think the, let's say I am paying a builder to build a family home in 1833 or whatever. Um, okay. Do okay. they? Do okay. they like? Is it a, an additional service, or do they do it without me knowing? Well, I think what was going on was that um, this practice was seen as part of a building, a builder's duty of care. He had to build a house that kept out the wind and the rain and the snow and the burglars, and he also took it to the next level and he tried to make it safe for the people who would live in these houses. So I think he very quietly had a word with... If, if, if he knew who was going to live in the house, he very quietly had a word with the head of that household and said, uh, could he please supply some shoes? Now, if, for example, as has happened... Uh, the builder was working in a rural area of Australia and he had no idea who was going to live in the house. He'd plant a cat and we have a number of cats uh, which were found in building voids in, in buildings. I, I have one myself <laughs> which was given to me by the people who didn't want to keep it in their house in, uh, in Marrickville in Sydney. So it's a little prop. Uh, Do you ever ring them up you. and ask if their house is haunted? <laughs> no, no. I think they would have told me. I think yeah. they would have told me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, uh, cats, cats were, I think, a generic form of protection when the builder couldn't find a shoe. Uh, it makes sense, particularly if it was protection specifically against witchcraft and, and that kind of stuff, as well as evil spirits. That seems to, you know, go together in my head. 
Well, I think uh, the belief was that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, cats protected uh, households from spirit, from vermin. And uh, if they were sent into the underworld, they would protect it from spiritual vermin. The other way of looking at cats is that they were the familiars of witches and they prowled around at night and uh, who knows what they got up to. So, you know, there's good and bad about cats, but whatever the whatever the thinking it was that went on, certainly a few cats got planted in buildings. Yeah. So I've I, given, I, talk, no, I've given talks about this, and uh, and people have asked me, well, was the, was the cat alive when it was uh, concealed in the building? And my answer is that I don't believe so. I think it was recently deceased. Hmm. Um, I I'm sure it must have been a couple of years ago now when they were excavating the house they believed the um, Pendle witches lived in. Uh, they had stuff in their walls too. One of which was a cat. Uh, it's interesting right. that you know they're they're doing the magic counter magic thing by by sticking their witches sticking cats in their own wall. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of uh, a lot more strange things went on in England than here. Uh, you know, I haven't found the clearly bizarre yet. Um, all of these concealments are pretty straightforward, um, and, and nothing really strange or quirky so far. But you know, you can look at the uh, evil averting marks and think they're pretty strange, uh, as indeed they are. Well, that I mean. This is interesting to me because it's my understanding that even in the UK, the idea of, of uh, apotropaic concealments only really occurred to uh, historians and academics kind of like mid 20th century. So, oh, even later, even okay. later, I think uh, uh, my friend Timothy Easton from Suffolk uh, really brought that up, and I think he he gave a talk. Um, uh, I just forget exactly where, somewhere in Suffolk in the 1980s or thereabouts, and he revealed for the first time, uh, you know, the, the results of his research, and he said, jaws dropped in the room, and then it was off. They were, they were out looking for these things, and uh, the gradually mind, yeah, more and more. The mind boggles out. as to how widespread it must have been then, given how often presumably... Uh, renovation on on historic properties has just kind of removed. Oh, this cat must have got in and died, or you know, somebody of dropped course, a shoe here. Course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Of course. Uh, uh, the concealments uh, occurred earlier than the, the discovery of the marks. Uh, you're you're quite right there, Gordon. Um, I don't have the information in my head at the moment, but. Um, uh, it does go back uh, quite a few years, around the middle of the uh, 20th century. And I'm, in fact, in, in regular touch with June Swan, who's one of the people who was responsible for finding this. June was for many years curator of the boot and shoe collection at Northampton Museum, right in the centre of the British bootmaking industry. And, uh, you know, she was curator of the boot and shoe collection and people would come in every couple of weeks and bring a shoe in. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until someone brought in a little child's shoe that was found in the thatch of their cottage that things really got strange for June and she realised there was something very odd going on. And in terms of the marks, uh, I mean, in Australia at least, the ones you've found so far, what are they typically? Are they are they crosses? Are they uh, hatches? Do they have little... Um, sort of crude drawings of things? What are, what is kind of like, talk us through the sort of marks we have found and you hope to find in Tasmania. Okay, okay. Well, there is one mark which consists of a network of concentric circles and uh, that has been found in Tasmania and in Perth in Western Australia where it was um, scratched into one of the roof timbers of the old Perth boys' school. Uh, it's been found in Tasmania. Uh, we also have uh, hexafoil, um, <clears throat> which is a circular mark, and inside the circle are what appear to be the 
petals of a daisy. Sometimes called a daisy wheel, but I prefer hexafoil. There are six petals, and you find this mark in all sorts of places in Australia. The latest amazing find came from Boulia in far north Queensland. Two hexafoils on a little old stone cottage, way, way up there in the back box. Um, and it's been found in Tasmania, um, uh, in, in New South Wales. Don't think I have any from South Australia yet, but certainly uh, Western Australia and Queensland. Why the daisy? Uh, well, I think this is a... Uh, I don't think it's a daisy. I think it's just uh, you know a common comparison. Gotcha. Uh, but but I think the hexafoil is a very ancient symbol, and uh, I, you know quite how it came about or where it came from. But uh, you do find that on some quite ancient stonework in, for example, uh, Greece, um, and I can't really be sure about Italy, but I wouldn't be surprised. I think I had um, for a, a previous guest I just recorded with her yesterday. She's um, Taiwanese American, and she's written a book on um, sort of Taoist sigils and, and and sigil making. And there's one called the Six Spiral Maze. And okay. and I think and just thinking about the concentric circles and even the hexafoil, how that works is uh, evil spirits get trapped. In uh, by, by yes, having to yes, navigate the maze, this. and I wonder if yes, something similar this. isn't going on with uh, the circles or, or the hexafoil. Well, yes, there's a bit of a theory about that too. Um, uh, we'll never know because it was never written down. Um, so you know, you can have all these theories, and they might be right, but uh, we can't uh, really say for sure. Um, you know, the chances are that it's right, but uh, who knows? And uh, nothing more, nothing more elaborate, nothing out of sort of the um, the blue grimoires or anything like that. It's it's usually no, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, there is another mark which is called a morel, and that looks like nothing more than chicken scratches. It's just uh, a series of half a dozen lines which intersect in the centre and. Uh, they're scratched up on buildings, and uh, you know these these are so inconspicuous. You know they're hiding in plain sight, if you like, and um, you have to know what they are in order to identify and recognise them. Um, but these have been found here, there, and everywhere. There's one on the uh, in the roof timbers of the uh, old Mint building in Macquarie Street in Sydney. There are more in Tasmania. Um, just trying to think where else I've found them, but uh, they're not as common as the hexafoils. That's probably the most yeah, common mark. You're, uh, yeah, you're into some some really interesting stuff here. I have to say. I mean, I, I know there'll be Australians listening who maybe have, uh, maybe their parents still live in you know in an old house where they have an aunt up as I do, although her house is not old enough, uh, up the Hunter Valley or something, that it, uh, it, it's now, I think people, next time they're in their oldest house in Australia, have a look for these marks. Where, where are they commonly please, found? Please, please. Uh, there are points of access, most commonly. So you find them by the side of windows, on front doors, um, um, just, just where evil things could come into a house. Uh, on the chimney breast is another place because things come down chimneys. Uh, you can just imagine uh, an evil being flying across uh, Windsor in the 1850s and he can see uh, smoke coming out of a chimney. He'll zoom down the chimney and uh, you need to have a hexafoil on the mantelpiece to keep him out. So, you know... Places where things could get into the building are we, where you find them. Cool. And uh, I guess if people do find this stuff or if, if they want to know more, um, yeah. where, where do they go to, to find out more about this, particularly the Tasmanian stuff? Because I have to tell you that uh, I, have, I have some friends who listen to the show and we talk endlessly of our love of Tasmania. So. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. 
Um, well, they can get in touch with me. That would be a good start. Um, uh, my email address is evansthebook at gmail.com. And for the Tasmanian Magic Project, because you shared a video with me as well, is there is there a page yeah. for that? Not yet, there isn't. Not yet. Not We're yet. just getting underway. Um, uh, a website is uh, in the cards, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, at this present time, I'm uh, funding the damn thing myself. The, I've, I have applications in for funding, but the the dollars and cents have yet to materialise. So you know, I'm paying all the bills and uh, hoping that eventually. Uh, the cargo will arrive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have um, friends who, I think maybe we already had this discussion, uh, historian friends in Australia who find it easier to get funding to do international projects <laughs> yeah. than, uh, than yeah. ones here. Yeah. I don't know. Well, actually, that's a good question to ask, Ian. Um, yeah. Why are we so shit at history? We have so much of it. It's the oldest continent on Earth. I know, I know. And, uh, you know, here I found something that... Uh, reveals a very strange chapter in our history and it's a new chapter in our history and I'm struggling to, to get the money to do the damn job. Um, I don't need very much. Um, I've had uh, I've had a suggestion to apply for funding in England, which I've done with the Vernacular Architecture Group. And uh, something may, some help may be coming from the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery in Launceston. But apart from that, it, that's it. That's it. Well, for people listening, if they do have ideas, uh, get in touch. I know we have academics who Please. listen to the show because there'll be there'll be a way to uh, there'll be a way to work it. I mean, this is fascinating information, and as you say, it paints a. Uh, it just adds for me because I've been interested in this stuff my whole life. It just adds a uh, a, a richer layer to the colonial experience. There's something. It does. Something it does. beautiful about magic because you get yeah. a glimpse of people's hopes and fears, and, and and all of a sudden, like the idea of the nighttime being it, loud and unfamiliar is right there in front of you. Them, it makes them more human, and it, it, it we can sympathise with them more because we understand them as people now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ian, I will have that information up in the show notes. Uh, it has been. Uh, a, a fascinating conversation. I uh, good luck with the project. We'll we'll definitely stay in touch over it because I think uh, right. I think you're doing something yes. something amazing. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your interest, Gordon. Much appreciated. There we are then. Uh, for those of you listening on a mobile device, I should point out that there is a bit of a bonanza of show notes this week. Uh, we have loads of photos from Dr. Evans' research. Uh, we have his entire thesis to download, should you so wish. Uh, there's a video describing the Tasmanian Magic Project, as well as additional reporting on his wider research from around the world. Uh, I expect we will be picking this story up again, because it certainly qualifies as a re-enchantment of the world, as far as I'm concerned, slash where I live. Uh, after the show, Dr. Evans and I chatted briefly about crowdfunding opportunities for continuing the Tasmanian Magic Project, so we'll keep you updated on that as well. And for the Australians listening, if you or your friends or relatives live in one of these historic properties, uh, definitely, definitely go and check out the images at runesoup.com and then have a look in old barns and fireplaces and around various points of entry and so on for scratched marks and that kind of thing that might look a little bit out of place. Uh, the same goes if you work in an historic building. It might be worth checking with maintenance staff or, or whoever uh, if they've seen anything uh, as well. And you will find Dr. Evans' contact details at the blog if uh, you qualify for that. Uh, and I guess speaking of contact, stay in it. Subscribe in your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube. Say hi at the RuneSoup Facebook page. Join the weekly newsletter or find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>